And welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the MAVEN project. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to our friends, the El Rio Pediatric Residency Program for hosting today's session on the patient with somatization disorder with Dr. Abramson. Dr. Scott Abramson joined Northern Cal California Kaiser Permanente in July of 1979, where he was on neurology staff for over 40 years. For over 25 years, Dr. Abramson has been passionately involved in the communication and physician wellness programs at Kaiser, where he has been on the regional board of physicians for these endeavors. He has written and developed programs on time management, physician to patient communication, physician to physician communication, and staff to physician communication. Dr. Abramson also writes a monthly column on communication issues and physician health and wellness that is only available to all Kaiser physicians. On a personal note, Dr. Abramson has been a longtime volunteer at the Samaritan House Medical Clinic in San Mateo, California, helping provide medical care for the indigenous of that county. He has also been a longtime volunteer at the USO, helping to provide rest and respite to the young men and women in our armed forces, and now also volunteers this time with the MAVEN Project. So Dr. Abramson, when you are ready, please begin. All right, thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you for all the support that you give here. Um, so uh, disclosures and disclosures and accreditation. And, um, you know, these are, you know, think about this. Uh, uh, choose the most likely answer for what your expectations are today. Because I'll tell you, this, this is tough. These people are tough. Um, I don't know if you can, uh, I, I don't, I can't really see you, but, uh, you know, maybe if you, you uh, by a show of hands, how many think the answer is A? Or can you, you see just, any? Yep, if anybody wants to raise their hand or if you wanna talk or if you just wanna type in the chat what your answer will be, that works too. Okay, well, I, I obviously I'm hoping that the answer will be B, but I, I, I'm just saying that this is, that these are really tough patients and, and I don't have a lot of magic solutions for this either, but maybe there's some things that, that uh, we can talk about that might be helpful because they, they are tough. Um, so this is, so the somatic symptom disorder, this is the, this is the definition uh, in the DSM-3. It's characterized by one or more symptoms that are accompanied by, and here's the important thing, by excessive thoughts, feelings, or behaviors rating, relating to the symptoms. So, I mean, you can be bothered by dizziness and palpitation and uh, itching all over and all this stuff. But if you, you know, say, well, no, it really doesn't bother me that much. I'll just live with it. No problem. Then that's really not a somatic symptom disorder. So it really has to have excessive thought, feelings, and behaviors relating. In addition, it has to cause significant distress or dysfunction in your life. And it doesn't necessarily, it, it can be rooted or based in actually organic disease. So in other words, like, let's say somebody has had a heart attack and he goes in, he gets treated for the heart attack and he gets, uh, you know, angioplasty or whatever, and everything's clear. And, and the patient keeps coming back. Oh, I feel these palpitations. I feel this. And everything is completely normal in the workup and everything. But it's so there is something that may be based in organic disease, but the reaction to it is far excessive to what would be normal. And um, in this new definition, so this idea that previously they called it somatoform disorder, hypochondriasis, pain disorder, and this is all lumped now into the somatic symptom disorder. So I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, the pathological somatic symptom disorder, and I'm hoping I'm gonna to get to talk to you about that healthy somatic symptom disorder. Now, the pathological thing is all that you could, anybody, you could look this up, read it in textbooks or online stuff, and I'm just gonna summarize kind of that activity. In my practice in neurology, I saw, you know, like average everyday working people, and they, I saw a lot of people with somatic symptom disorders of a neurological nature, and I would say the majority of them were not the pathological somatic symptoms, they were healthy. And I'm gonna, I hope I, I can talk to you more about that. And, and I, I think that'll give you more perspective about the whole thing. So, you know, when you, when you see one of these patients and you look at their 
active problem list, you know, you see this patient is on your schedule for the day. Absolutely, actually, you're, I'm sure you're probably thrilled and just can't wait to, to see that patient. But, uh, you know, in the old days, we used to call this, we, before the electronic medical record, we used to call this a thick chart patient. You obvious, obviously why. Nowadays, we call it a long scroll patient because, you know, by the time you scroll down the problem list, you're just scrolling and scrolling. And, you know, it could be about two or three days before you reach the end. Now, so in the somatic symptom disorder, again, this is all stuff you can find in textbooks, but there's a lot of surveys that you can give to people in your office or whatever. And this is the PQ, PHQ-15, and it just lists the number of symptoms that someone could have. And then, you know, you score each one and they get a score and so forth. But the fact is you could have just one. I mean, you could just have uh, a somatic symptom with just the symptom of dizziness. But if that dominates your life and destroys your life, that's, that's all it takes is one symptom. Here's a, there's a lot of, again, there's other, this is a, a sample kind of survey. There's other ones, it's called the Whiteley Index. And this measures not how many symptoms, but this, this measures your anxiety about how much anxiety do you have a, about these symptoms? And you can see these questions are pretty pertinent and you give them a score and, and so forth. So, uh, so when do you suspect somatic symptom disorder? Okay. And these are, again, I, I'm sure these are pretty obvious to you. History of present illness, vague and inconsistent, uh, normal tests, multiple courses of standard therapy, um, normal, gee, doctor, you know, I, I like I burped three times in a row last night. I'm sure it's something wrong. I must have stomach cancer or something, you know, um, repeating. The, these are all things I think you've probably seen. Avoiding physical activity, and, and that's what a lot of these people do, and that's the worst thing you can do. The best thing is for them to be physically active. I think that's the one of the best treatments they can do because a lot of them are so worried about their symptoms, they, they're afraid to do anything. And that just makes it worse. Very high sensitivity to medication effects, um, seeking care from multiple doctors, refusing to grant permission. And um, I mean, these are all things that I think are probably pretty obvious to you. And probably this is this is probably the hallmark thing, right? You, they, they're in your office and you just feel frustrated. You, I mean, there, sometimes you can't put your finger on it, but you just feel uncomfortable. And that's what that's what these folks do to us. Um, so the risk factors, and and again, this is all kind of standard stuff. You're probably, um, this is probably uh, people that you see that have these risk factors that have this background. And also, they also, and I think this is something that maybe we overlook, but there's a history of sexual abuse. And sometimes it's really, it's really difficult or, or it's uncomfortable for us to ask about a history of sexual abuse. Um, let me let me uh, let me ask one. Of you, maybe we can let me ask one of you you folks, and you can unmute. Just wait about. Think about this for about ten seconds, and then if anyone would like to suggest a, a way, uh, a tactful way to ask a, an effective way to ask about sexual abuse, let's. I'd like to hear that. Let's go. One, two, Mississippi. Three, Mississippi. Four, Mississippi. Five, Mississippi. Seven Mississippi, eight Mississippi, nine Mississippi, ten Mississippi. Anybody have any thoughts on how you do that? So, anybody want to unmute? Kristen, you want to unmute anybody? And if anybody, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Hello. We we can hear you, Crystal. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so you could ask her during a heads exam with, um, like a teenage patient that's all alone, or if it's a younger patient, sometimes just pulling, um, a parent out of the room and not speaking in front of the child. Um, especially if they're a foster child and just getting a, a thorough history. But I think doing this in more of a private setting, either with a parent or patient is probably the most appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. Separate the, the patient from family members, even if they're not a child. I mean, even if the wife and the husband come in the room, you know, uh, obviously, yeah, good, a good suggestion is keep them separate. Um, yeah, you know what, um, what, what I do is some, as I'll say something like this, you know, I, it's hard to directly ask somebody. So I say, you know, um, I've seen several patients that uh, had this same kind of palpitation that you've been having in uh, you know, strangely enough, all, all these patients had a had had 
um, very um, horrific experiences with sexual uh, abuse at a young age. I'm just throwing that out there. You know, I, I, I mean, it's there's all sorts of ways to do this, but uh, that's that's one way to do it. But certainly, you're right about about separating people. So treatment. How do you? So again, I'm giving you to standard textbook stuff. So here's the treatment with your primary care provider. Um, regular visits, not based on symptoms. Now this is this is a challenge because it basically it's like I, you know, you you don't want to see them on these crisis things where they got to be seen at 4:30 on a Friday. But okay, every two weeks, come in. We'll go over the list. We'll do this. We'll try to do this. I mean, it's that that may be difficult to do because you know you. You know, most people aren't really thrilled about seeing these people in their clinic, no matter what. Um, evaluate and treat, diagnose. So even, you know, even a, even a broken clock is right twice a day, you know. So even though they have all these somatic symptoms, I mean, maybe this time the chest pain, they were shoveling snow, maybe it does mean something. Um, you know, even the, even the blind squirrel can find the occasional acorn, they say. So limit tests and referral. I think that's that's important. You know, you don't want to keep referring people. I mean, after they've had a certain number of tests and x-rays and so forth, I think these are all good. Continue to reassure, uh, try to discontinue. And a lot of these people are on so many different medicines. Everybody's tried something and they never seem to stop one medicine. So I think that's a great, a great strategy is to try to get them because who knows, some of these symptoms may be caused by the medicine itself. Um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety. I mean, sometimes these can work, but uh, you know, people will people will say, "No, doc, I'm not taking an anti-anxiety. It's not anxiety. I've got real. I've, there's something really wrong with my heart." Um, psych referral. Uh, again, it's the same thing. If you can, if they go to a site, if they are willing to go, that's great. But most of them are going to be saying something like, oh, "It's not in my head, doc. I mean, you better find you find the answers. You just like all the rest saying it's in my head." Uh, so again. Um, and then again, this is the standard textbook stuff of what you're supposed to do. Establish therapeutic alliance with the patient. But how do you do that? How do you establish a therapeutic alliance with, with a patient you know, like this? I mean, to me, that's a real challenge. I mean, and how do we create, create a therapeutic alliance that's also therapeutic for us because we have to protect ourselves in this therapeutic alliance. And, uh, I, and, you know, you always see these like new clinicians that are coming on board and they're just out of training and they're so, it's beautiful to watch. I mean, they're so idealistic and they're going to cure the planet and every, you know, and then they, and then they see a few of these patients and they, you know, bust themselves and do everything they can and seeing them every three days and the word gets around and this is such a nice doctor. Oh, let's go to there, you know, and pretty soon that, that newbie is Dr. Newbie or a nurse newbie is pretty worn now. So how do we create a therapeutic alliance with a patient that's also protective of ourselves? Let me ask you to think about that for about 10 seconds. Just think about that. What do you do? Anybody got any thoughts? And you can, un Kristen, you can unmute if anybody wants to share, you know, what, how they do this. It's a challenge. All right, Sheila has her hand un uh, raised, so I'm going to unmute Sheila. Okay. Go ahead, Sheila, you should be able to talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, sometimes with patients like this in our clinic, um, we've tried to set boundaries as well as like those regular visits. Um, you know, we will try and bring them in, um, kind of somewhat regularly, you know, unfortunately we haven't been able to do like every three weeks, but we can do bring them in as soon as, as, as often as possible, but then kind of putting some boundaries on, you know, sometimes how many times they can call a day. Um, some of these patients, at least for us have called like many, many times a day. Um, yeah. and it just kind of really wears out the staff. So, um, you know, reassuring them that we have that, you know, we're caring for them and that we, you know, we'll see them on a regular basis, but um, making it more kind of scheduled so it, it doesn't overwhelm people. Uh -huh. Yeah, setting those boundaries. And you're right, sometimes these people will call, you know, several times an hour, not just several times a day. I know. And, uh, 
it, boy, it, it can be tough. Um, so let, let me ask you this. Think about this one. How do you, if, if you see someone like this, and with all the criteria that we talked about, all the stuff, all the problem list, you know, all the, all the surveys fill out, and, and it's, a, it's a somatic symptom disorder. How do you explain it to the patient? Think about this for about 10 seconds. How do you, what, how do you, how do you explain it? Think about it about 10 seconds. One, Mississippi, two, Mississippi, three, Mississippi, four, Mississippi, five, Mississippi. Okay. Anybody, anybody have any thoughts about this? Because I, 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 let me just say this, I, I can tell you this, I can tell you something that doesn't work. If you say, you know what, there, there is nothing wrong with you. It's all in your head. You got to get a grip, uh, you know, divorce that husband, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I can tell you that has a low likelihood of working. Doctor, we have two people with their hands up, so. Uh, Sheila, go ahead. You should be unable to unmute yourself again. And Crystal, you have the ability as well. Okay. We, we have, um, someone here who would like to answer this question. Okay. Yeah. I was just thinking that, um, sometimes when we have people like this, um, in the ER, especially who have a lot of complaints, sort of explaining it as like a mental stressor can sometimes come out in physical ways. And there's a lot that we don't know about medicine. Uh -huh. Um, kind of, I feel like a lot of times gives patients a little bit of peace, knowing that you don't think that they're crazy, but you don't necessarily know what's going on. So uh -huh. coming up with common goals of treatment rather than just hearing these complaints that, you know, maybe they don't have a known source or any like identifiable way to fix them. So coming up with a plan of like what bothers them the most and what would they like to see out of treatment I find has been helpful with people like this. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Gosh, um, hold on um, yeah, I, I, I love that. And I love the, I love the idea of explaining that this is this mind body connection that sometimes when psychologically things are going on in your mind that, you know, it can affect your body. It can affect how you feel. And, um, you know, a, a, and a typical example to, to, to demonstrate that to people that that's readily understandable is like, like somebody gets embarrassed and they blush. So that, that feeling of embarrassment sends messages to your blood vessels and your blood vessels dilate and it makes you red. I mean, it's, that's the mind body connection. I, I, I think that's, that's kind of where, where it begins, where the explanation begins. Um, so we're going to talk about the pathological somatic symptom disorder. I'm going to save the healthy one. I mean, those are the patients. I, I see a lot of those, probably the majority of the somatic symptoms I see I, in, in clinics like El, uh, El Rio and other places. It may be different, but let's just talk about the pathological. So here's one thing. One question, you know, um, could this is to ask, could this be related to stress? Could these palpitations, could this chest pain, could this dizziness be related to stress? And I mean, if they say yes, oh boy, you're golden. Because then, gosh, um, uh, because then, because then you can, you can say, hey, okay, I'll tell you what, let's, Let's work on the stress part. Let's work on the stress. This is, this is a strategy. Let's work on the stress part and let's see if it will help the palpitations and the chest pain. We've done all the tests on them. We've done all the treatments that we can on them. Let's try something different. We'll work on the stress part, see if it helps. Of course, the problem is, you know, most of those people with this pathological somatic symptom, they're, they're probably not going to buy it. No, doctor, I have no stress. You know, no, it's not anxiety. Are you just like all the other doctors? No, it's not that. So you're back to the same place. So here's something, I'm gonna throw this out. I mean, uh, um, this is this is kind of, uh, as a communication consultant at Kaiser, this was kind of our approach to 
facing almost any, any communication problem was the four habits. We invest in the beginning, we get patient perspective, make empathic statement and close the visit. So this is, so I'm gonna suggest these things. They may or may not work for you with these patients, um, but just, um, but think about, think about trying this, the four habits. So invest in the beginning. Um, and one of the things is, you know, thinking, you know, why, why does this patient trigger me? What, why is this a hot button for me? I mean, I mean, certainly there's a reason why you can be annoyed and irritated and all that, but sometimes it's overboard. Sometimes it's more than that. I mean, did you have a, maybe you had a family member that stole all the oxygen in the family because of somatic complaints. And maybe this means more than just another somatic symptom disorder. Um, um, also, you know, uh, one of these things is these people make us feel helpless. They're frustrating. We, we, we're in here to help people. And when we see these people, we try everything, we do everything, and we get nowhere a lot of times. And it in, engenders that helpless feeling that we get. And because we feel helpless in what, we're, what our career is, what our mission is, we get resentful. So it's just, it, it, it's like, what invest in the beginning it's sort of like let's take a let's take a self temperature here and what's going on with me now get patient perspective so what patient perspective questions might you ask a somatic symptom disorder patient one with a long scroll list seen multiple doctors doesn't believe it's in the due to stress, won't see a psychiatrist, won't take antidepressants, or they took them and they had reactions to everyone they took. So what patient perspective question might you ask? Think about that for about 10 seconds. So I'm gonna suggest some questions that you could ask. Um, you know, you've seen five specialists and had numerous tests. Every, why do you think that is? Um, why is it so difficult to believe your clinicians? What are you most afraid of? I'm sure you've got some other ones too, but the point is to ask those questions. Why? I mean, I, there's a nurse, when I worked at Kaiser, we had a nurse practitioner and she worked in the pre-op clinic. Her name was Angela Serpa. And what she did is, you know, she would call the patients about a week before their operation. And she would explain to them, you know, what the operation with the pre-op, what the operation again was gonna do, post-op care, what they had to come in for blood tests, they had to come in for EKG, all the stuff, where to go, all that stuff. She'd explain everything. And at the end of that, she would say, she would ask them this question. She would say, how can I make things easier for you? I mean, it's going into surgery is a frightening thing. You see, so at the end of it, she'd say, how can I make things easier for you? So she told me she was talking to one woman like this and there was a long silence on the phone. And finally, the woman answered in three words. She said, you just did. You just did. You know, just asking the question. You know, we care what you think. What's going on in your mind? That can, that can help that. Getting patient perspective can enhance that therapeutic alliance. So the third thing in our, you know, was make an empathic statement. Now, you can now certainly you can make empathic statements about their suffering, and and I and I think that's totally appropriate. You know, it must be tough suffering with your palpitations. Boy, the chest pain must be uncomfortable. You know, all that stuff. But what other empathic kind of statement can you make? What other empathic kind of statement can you make? Uh, think about that for about ten seconds. And does anybody want to uh, anybody want to suggest another kind of empathic statement you can make? Oh, 
if you already have been unmuted, you can just unmute yourself and add uh, an answer, or if you wanted to use your raised hand feature, if you have not been unmuted yet, and I will give you that ability. Okay, well, um, here's, let me make these suggestions. Let me make these suggestions. So you can make empathic statements about the suffering of the symptom itself, but how about this? Um, it must be tough distrusting your doctors. It must be tough feeling no one believes you. You know, you're, you're, you're making empathic statements about the process that they're going through. Um, and again, you know, we're talking about how to create a therapeutic alliance. And these are the kind of things that can bring patients to trust you and to trust your advice. But on the other hand, we know how tough that is to, to make a, a therapeutic intervention that's gonna be followed and it's gonna be helpful. But at least these kind of things, getting perspective, make an empathic statement about the process they're going through. These kind of things can, can bring people closer to you. And if they feel closer, that they trust you, they, maybe they'll follow your advice. But on the other hand, we have to protect ourselves. We have to protect ourselves. And so as we close the visit or as we, you know, strategies here, here's some, a couple things to think about. One is acknowledge the impasse and other is saying no. So, so it, it's acknowledging the impasse. So you might say something like this at the outset of seeing them. And, you know, we're gonna do a full evaluation. I'm gonna review all of your charts, all of your tests. Um, but if after, you know, I evaluate you and cannot find any answer, just like all the other doctors, and I'm going to try my best, I'm going to look at it with an open mind, what do you recommend we do then? And you see the strategy here, the strategy here is putting the ball in their court. What do we do? Um... You can even make suggestions, you know, we'll, we'll, how about stress management? How about seeing, how about cognitive behavioral therapy? How about an exercise program? I mean, you could make suggestions, but basically you want to put the ball back in their court because this therapeutic alliance, you, you know, it's a, it's a push and pull. You want them to trust you, connect with you, but you also got to protect yourself. Listen, I'm just... You know, you're not going to find this stuff in a textbook or anywhere. This is this is sort of my personal um, suggestions of, and what I've done and and how I've tried to deal with these people. And like I said at the beginning, you know, it's uh, I, I nobody has a lot of success, honestly. Um, but part of it is protecting ourselves. Yeah, put the ball in their court. Ease the burden on yourself. So. Close the visit. Again, there's another, you know, is that whatever you do, you know, if you're saying no, you're not going to get the CAT scan, you're not going to get the x-rays, make it from a point of aligning with the patient. You know, I'm, I'm here for your best interest. I don't want to see you get another CAT scan, be exposed to all those x-rays. I, I, I don't want to give you the Norco. It's, it's really going to be bad for your kidneys and your liver. I, uh, I you know, um, I, I, uh, whatever, you, you know, you're doing this because you're looking out for them. And if you can put yourself in that position, I mean, it's going to be a lot easier to have these conversations. And so this, I'm your new best friend, you know? So these are some strategies about with a pathological um, somatic symptom disorder have to do with protecting yourself. It's a, like I said, it's push and pull. You want to bring these people to, to be able to have some trust so you can, you, you, they might follow you. This is the good suggestions you have, but you don't want to get drawn in to, to um, just, just this never ending, uh, whoops, pit. Okay. So, um, does it, you know, let me, uh, let me stop right here. Um, does, is there anything that uh, anybody would like to add or criticize? Does, does, does this make, no sense at all? Is it not helpful at all? Is it just pure fluff or is there some value in it or any comments? Let me just stop right now before we go further.
I don't see any comments yet, Dr. Abramson, so I no think, I think okay. we're good. Okay. Okay, dope. So, um, so now I'm gonna talk about the healthy somatic symptom disorders. And these are people with the same kind of, uh, just same, the somatic symptoms disorder. They may just have one or two symptoms. It may just be this unexplained dizziness. It may just be this unexplained palpitation. It may be unexplained fatigue or whatever it is, but it's something that just dominates their life that changes their behavior, that, that makes life um, not intolerable, but, but it really affects the quality of their life. And again, there's, there's, um, there's no medical organic explanation for the symptoms. So I see, and they've had full testing, seen a lot of doctors and so forth. So these, but these are the healthy somatic symptoms too. These are the people that I saw probably I mean, these were the, probably 75% of the somatic symptoms disorders that I saw, you know, just, just were these healthy people. So who are they? Um, these are the healthy, worried, well somaticizers. They're not sad. They're not stressed, anxious, or depressed. I mean, of course, the usual stuff, just everyday stuff, but they're normal, hardworking, busy, productive people. And a lot of times, you know, I, I, what happened, I would get to who they are by asking the right questions. And here's the questions that I would ask these people. I mean, not all at once, but, but various questions. These are the, <laughs> you know, the healthy, hardworking type that are just almost disabled by their dizziness or by their palpitation or by their this or that. Uh, do you tend to take the things more seriously and more diligent? Are you wound kind of tight? Do you worry more than most? Do you tend to overthink? Are you more perfectionistic? Uh, you know, are you more type A, type B? Do you have a to-do list? Um, are you do it now? Uh, do you arrive early for appointments? I mean, these are all, um, some people are being too controlling. Um, when do you, when you go on vacation, you know, um, when I go on vacation, I am packed like two weeks before I go on vacation. I mean, it's like, I want to be there. I, everything's got to be there. I don't want any last minute stuff. And, uh, you know, my wife is just, she's like, we're, we may be leaving on a plane in the afternoon. And that morning she's packing. I'm saying, you know, how can you pack in the morning? I mean, you know, you, we, we, we knew we were going to take this a month. It drives me crazy. All right. So uh, these are the questions to ask. Oh, and the other question I always ask these people, what's your spouse like? And invariably, the people that have this path, this this healthy somatic symptom sort, their spouse is totally opposite, totally opposite. And uh, I'd say, well, what what if you married someone like you? And they'd say, we kill each other, we kill each other, no doubt. So this is what these people, this is what these people are like. Um, and the diagnosis, this is they're they're hardworking, busy, perfectionistic functioning, revved up, they're driven, they're goal-oriented, fast walking, you know, they got the to-do list, they're line avoiding, workaholic, housework housewife-aholic, pack a week before vacation type people, that's who they are. And, you know, they, they also are afflicted with these somatic symptoms that are making their life pretty lousy. They're not sad, they're not stressed, anxious, or depressed. So, you know, again, so how do you explain? So to them, it's these are these people are much easier to deal with. And you and once you talk to them and develop a therapeutic relationship and, and develop an understanding, uh, the, the the success with these people are is really good. And matter of fact, I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many nurses and fellow physicians I saw with various symptoms like this. So of course you want to develop this mind body connection and brain blushing. Of course, when things go on in your, on your brain, there's chemicals, there's hormones, and it, and it causes changes in the body. Um, you know, you're, and these are the kind of people, like I said, their brain engine is revved up. And when your brain engine is revved up, it sends out all these, these chemicals. And I, I, you know, we had a very working class population, a lot of people that work with their hands, blue collar. And so they understood this. And so I'd say, you know, your brain engine is revved up and you're, you're getting the exhaust fumes. And what the exhaust fumes are, are, the, are actually the chemicals, you know, and these chemicals are affecting your 
body and going to that dizzy center of the brain and making you dizzy and going to the palpitation center of the brain. And, you know, I, I, and then I'd actually add a personal thing to that. I'd say, you know what, um, you know, I get acid indigestion. And what happens to me when I get sort of revved up and all that, you know, my brain starts sending chemicals to the part of the brain that sends out acid to my stomach and I get acid indigestion. So that is, that's kind of, you know, again, and this is kind of that mind body explanation that I give. Oh, um, the CHFHC syndrome. Do, you, do you, any of you know what that is? Um, I'm sure you don't. I'm sure no one knows what this is. And the reason you don't is because I discovered it. I made it up. And so um, here's what, uh, here's what happened. Here's, here's the, and this, this really will crystallize who these people are. So, like I said, I see a lot of these patients in my clinic and I'm seeing this, this young woman and she's got this chronic dizziness. She's can't go to the gym anymore. She's really just constantly dizzy. It's just really making her life miserable. And um, it, you know, she's turns out she was a, she's a executive secretary. She's wife. She's got two young kids. She takes them all around a karate practice and this and that she's got, um, uh, she was like, she, she was like head cheerleader in high school, you know, this really perky person, you know, but just on the go revved up all the time. So she comes in with all this dizziness stuff and I, and, and uh, explain, you know, the mind body connection and everything like that. And she comes back the next uh, couple of weeks and she says, you know, Dr. Abramson, she says, you know, I, I uh, heard what you said. And, um, and what I did is I hired a housekeeper. Okay, good. Now, now guess what she did the night before the house cleaner, house cleaner came. I know you women out there will be able to understand and guess this. She was, she was up all night cleaning the house because she didn't want the house cleaner to think she had a dirty house. You know, that's who these people are. I told this, to, to, told this story to my wife. She says, well, of course, you know, that's what she's gonna do. Yeah, I, I mean, every woman would do that, you know. So, I mean, that's who, that's, so this is, so this is the syndrome who these people are, these healthy things. It's the clean, the CHFHC, the clean house for the house cleaner syndrome the clean house for the house cleaner syndrome. Uh, and I bet there's some of you that suffer with the same syndrome. I don't know whether, you know, you've got the somatic symptoms to go with it, but, but it's, it's there. And that's, that really defines a, a lot who these folks are. So the treatment is, um, you know, again, it's like, you know, it's with the, with the pathological ones in, in a way, it's like, you know, you reassure there's nothing serious, it will get better, but not right away. Uh, worrying about these symptoms, at least you can tell them and reassure them, this is what it is, you know, and it's worrying will make it worse. So just don't worry about it, get back into exercise. You know, yoga, meditation, all that stuff can be helpful. I really don't like to use medication for these people. I'd really rather they get out of it themselves. And um, I always, you know, I tell people that I, you know, partly a victim of this. Um, and uh, I also tell them, look, don't change your personality. I mean, one of the, one of the patients I, I talked with this was a, was the uh, supervising mechanic for United Airlines. And he was this meticulous guy and, you know, revved up everything, had to be perfect and everything. And I said, look, don't change, don't change your person. Don't get a brain transplant because we need you. We need, if I, I fly United, you know, when I leave San Francisco, you know, don't change it, be the same guy, do that. But I'm just telling you, this is the, this is one of the downsides of, of being who you are. Um, but, but you people make the world go round. Um, so uh, this is, so this is the dialogue that we have. Um, uh, and when, the, I mean, and this is more toward the, this, this I'm talking about the healthy somatic symptom disorder. Again, I, I have a feeling that you don't see many as, as many as I do, you're seeing more the pathological, but if you do, so they're all, so this is a question. So it's all in my head. Yeah, well, 
it is kind of in your head. I mean, there's something, there's something really happening physically, but it's because of those brain chemicals. Remember we had the conversation about the brain chemicals and how you blush and all that. Um, one less test. Let me go to Stanford, let them do the CMOL scan. Uh, when they ask that question, that means they didn't get it. You just got to go through the whole thing again. Uh, why now? I've been like this all of my life. And I always tell people, look, it's kind of like when you're jogging, you know, you out and jog and you jog, you know, seven miles a day for the last 30 years. And eventually you're out there jogging, doing the same thing and your knee gives out. It's that cumulative thing. It's that cumulative thing of having your brain, you know, revved up. And for the first 30 years, you could have resilience. But after that, you know, you get a little older and that revved up brain, those chemicals start breaking through. Those hormones start breaking through. Uh, how come it didn't happen? You know, my mother-in-law moved in. How come it didn't happen then? And I always say, well, you know, when you're really stressed, a lot of times we, you know, we have this endorphin response. And so that can block some of the effects of all these chemicals. And then when mother-in-law leaves, boom, then it's, it's kind of like the, 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 the college student or the medical student that gets a migraine, not studying for exams, not during the exams, but right after they're over. So they built up these endorphins and everything's, you know, fighting this off, boom, they, the endorphin levels drop and all that stress and so forth comes through. I was on vacation in Hawaii. Why was I still dizzy then, you know? Uh, and here's the thing is these, a lot of these people, I'm talking about the healthy pathological, like by CHFHC, the clean house for the house cleaner lady, you know, the thing is they go on vacation, but it's not what they go on is crusades of tourism. You know, they go someplace, got to see this, got to be at the museum here, got to eat dinner at five, great restaurant, you know, let's get packed. Come on, come on, let's go family. Um, you know, when when uh, when my kids were growing up, my, my son now, he's grown now, but he looks back and says, dad, uh, we never went on, he says, yeah, we went on vacation. It was, it was vacation boot camp. That's what it was. Um, so it's like the American Express with this attitude of, you know, being revved up and so forth. It's like the American Express, you know, they don't leave home without it. They take it on vacation. Um, so anyway, that sort of side. So I've talked mainly, I think I've, I've tried to bring in both of these things, the pathological somatic symptom disorder, the healthy somatic symptom disorder patient. Um, uh, so here's some points for the, for the pathological. Always ask the question, can stress, could stress make, be making this worse? Or, you know, if, if, uh, let's work on the stress part. You know, think about it. Why is this patient, why am I so upset with this patient? Is it just a normal, you know, kind of annoyance for this kind of person or is there something deeper? You know, why is it so difficult to be reassured? Must be tough when your clinicians don't believe you. You know, we're at an impasse. What can we do now? Uh, put the ball in their court. And remember, you know, these people are not, um, stressed, anxious, or no, you have normal stress. I mean, they're, they're, but not, not total life stress. And, and this is the mind body connection that, 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 you know, that, uh, I think that, that when they, when these people learn to trust you, I think you have a good chance and work with them and a good chance of success. So what's the payoff? Maybe a happy patient with the healthy, with a healthy somatic symptom, and maybe a happy clinician. I'm not saying happy. I'm saying maybe there's a different word. Um, uh, less unhappy uh, might be better. Um, so anyway, uh, there you go. Uh, that's, those are the suggestions I have. Like I said at the beginning, the, the pathological somatic symptom disorders are very, very tough, very tough. And, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe maybe one or two of these suggestions may help you um, navigate this difficult path. Um, and um, I don't know, how, Kristen, I don't, I don't know how much time we have, but I'm, I'm open for any comments or questions or alternative talks. Yeah, we have about 13 minutes, but if we need to go a little bit over. Okay. Um, the first uh, comment that we had when you were talking about the, uh, the cleaning lady and you know, high, cleaning first, uh, the El Rio group said, yes, many of us in the room agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. It's, uh, um, 
the, the male, now the male, the male equivalent of that is the guy that takes his car, you know, his beloved car to the car wash and, and goes with the car wash guys and washes the car just to make sure that they get every spot, you know? You found so, my father. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Kristen. Hi. This is Crystal. I have a medical student, Sarah, here with a question slash comment. Hi, Dr. Uh, Abramson. Um, in your experience, have any patients done well with um, therapy like EMDR that works more subconsciously than um, CBT, which is more like if the patient's not recognizing that they have a problem, there's something more subconscious like EMDR somatic therapy. Um, do you have any information on that or from your experience used it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point about the uh, uh, cognitive behavior. I mean, they have to have, you know, the, the, they, they have to realize that, hey, you know, I, I'm having these thoughts and these thoughts of, you know, that, uh, oh, I'm a bad person or I didn't do this. I'm a lazy person. You know, if they have, they, they have to address the thoughts and realize that these thoughts are not helpful. And then if they can say, well, let me change my thinking and that may change my mood or behavior, then I can change my behavior. So, um, so you're right. That's a good insight that, that CBT may not be that helpful for these people. Um, it is more helpful with people with the conversion reactions, what we call fun functional, the people that have, that come in that are paralyzed, you know, with a somatic symptom disorder that actually don't just have symptoms, but have an actual paralysis or something. But uh, yeah, so uh, let me, so refresh my, what is EMDR, what, 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 do, what do those initials stand for? You said well, EMDR? My question is if you've used it in your experience or if have like any literature on it um, in regards to somatic symptom disorder. What, what, is, what is EMDR? What is EMDR? Um, it's similar to rapid eye movement. Um, and Say that again. It's what? It's what? It's similar to using rapid eye movement to kind of work on the subconscious. I know there's a lot of literature surrounding okay. PTSD treatment with EMDR. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, honestly, I don't, I don't have any experience with that. I don't. Um, have 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 you seen uh, uh, literature that supports that it works in in this? Uh, for PTSD, but I was wondering for somatic symptom disorder, but that's okay. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. I have a question, Dr. Benson. Yes. Hi. Um, so we're seeing an increasing number of tick disorders like Tourette's in our um, general peds clinic, and this may or may not be due to the fact that there's increased visibility on social media. Um, what advice do you have for the general pediatrician when faced with a patient who's presenting with tick ticks um, before we refer them to peds neurology, who for the most part aren't really able to do much for them? Hmm. Um, and you're, are you talking about the ticks without the vocalizations or, or with the vocalizations? You know, the Tourette's, you're talking about Tourette syndrome where they actually have ticks and then, and then vocalizations? Uh, well, with them, you know, in the scatological, usually scatological sounds or things like that, or, or just the ticks? Um, either motor or vocal or a combination of both. both. Okay. Yeah, I think that the, um, that the people that have the, you know, the motor ticks and the vocalization, I mean, that's, you're talking, that's Tourette syndrome. And, um, you know, you're, uh, and you know, there's, I mean, there are medications uh, that can calm those down, but I think that most pediatricians don't like to use any of those medicines because those are powerful things to put in a child's brain. Um, you, and I know usually they're, I mean, um, obviously I think the family and, and the kids need, need therapy. And uh, uh, as far as the, as far as just the ticks, uh, as far as just the ticks go, I mean, gosh, you know, ticks are a lot of kids just, I mean, a lot of kids grow out of Tourette's too, but, but a lot of kids just have, um, you know, ticks uh, that are transient. They come and go sometimes after a viral illness. Uh, sometimes um, and medications can do that. Um, but I don't, um, you know, uh, in, in adults, we would do, you know, we do a, just a full metabolic workup with thyroid, liver disease, liver function test, you know, all are, are just the basic, um, uh, uh, you know, blood panel and so forth. 
uh, but I'm not, I haven't really, uh, I'm not really sure what the pediatricians are doing now. And when you send patients to them with the ticks, what are they, what are you getting back from them? What are they saying? What advice are they giving? I guess this is more in the case where you're, you're confident and it's not really um, an organic issue. Like you're confident oh. it's not Tourette's and it's more behavioral. Well, okay. Okay. So it's more of a, a behavioral tick. I don't know that that would, um, I don't know that those are in, in I don't know that's, uh, that, that, that's interesting. I'm not sure if that would be diagnosed as a somatic symptom disorder, but certainly it's, it's kind of like that. It, I mean, if it's a, you know, uh, in, in the same kind of category. Um, uh, gosh, you know, I think that this is with a child, with a kid like that, you know, boy, this is something that it seems to me that you'd want to really get a good family history. What's going on in the family? What's going on at school? What's going on with his friends? You know, how's he, the kid is, how's the kid feeling about himself? What are his fears? What are what are his, what is he frightened of? I mean, to me, I mean, to me, that's what would be the most, you know, pertinent thing to do. Uh, and do you think there's anything else? That, any other things that are important to do? No, um, I I agree with you. I think getting a good social history is important to identify any stressors. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. There's got to be, and boy, any kid growing up, there's got to be, uh, there's no kid that doesn't, that grows up without stressors. I mean, gee whiz. Yeah. All right. So we have one comment. It was like, I I am finding these suggestions so helpful. Thank you. Oh, and good. then we have this question. Okay. I've been pondering a statement I heard recently and talk about anxiety that the worried well are not well. Their anxiety or worry is a legitimate disorder affecting their quality of life that should be recognized, validated, and addressed. Is this pathological too? Even if we think they're medically healthy, um, we may be doing them a disservice by describing them as well or healthy. How does this concept fit in with your approach? The, um, so that would, so I think there's two things here. So if you have if you have a variety of symptoms, you know, you're dizzy, you got palpitation and so forth, and you're, and you're anxious about those, and you know, that's somatic symptom disorder. But if you're, if you're have just, you're generally anxious and you're, it's not so much related to symptoms that you're having, but you're just anxious about, oh my God, the, the, I, I think that the, that the world is going to collapse. There's going to be a meteor that's going to be hitting me. I, I'm afraid to go out on the street in the daytime because the mailman gives me funny, you know, I mean, if you're just, so if it, you're anxious about just general stuff and not physical symptoms, I think that that would be in another category and that would be like a general anxiety disorder. And those people, um, I mean, I mean, that's, I think that would be a general anxiety disorder and, you know, treated as, as you might treat a, um, you know, a psychiatric, um, illness, uh, the, but are you, but are you saying like, are, are you think, saying that the people that I was talking about with these healthy, these healthy people that, um, you know, that, and, uh, I, I th um, so these, so like I said, these are the people that I see that have these physical symptoms. They may not even be that. They may not even be anxious. They're just, they're just feeling these symptoms, and it's related to their, the fact that these people are just revved up all the time. I don't know if that answered your question, um, but. I just want there is a dip, so the general anxiety they're they're anxious about the world about everything you know about walking in the street the, the, that uh, they're just anxious about everything whereas the somatic uh, symptom disorder they are anxious but their anxiety is about their physical symptoms. I think that answered it. Okay. So I don't see any other questions coming through. So I'll pause for a second. If you have any other questions, please use the Q&A box, chat box, raise your hand. But while we wait, just a reminder, if you are going to, um, if you're interested in the CME credit, 
that when you close out of this Zoom webinar, it's going to, the survey is going to appear in a tab on your browser. If you miss it, it'll be in the email tomorrow. Um, we just have a thank you. So thank you again, Dr. Abramson. Thank you all for joining today. And uh, Crystal, if you guys want to stay on after everybody uh, ends, I will uh, talk about the Maven Project. So thank you again, Dr. Abramson. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for listening and, and thank you, Kristen. I really appreciate your, your support. Absolutely. Have a great night, everybody.